Hi everyone, I'm Jean-Marc Boyadzis. I'm a neurosurgeon specializing in both brain and spinal surgery. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is an operation called posterior cervical foraminotomy. I'm going to review the anatomy of the cervical spine, which is the area of the spine related to the neck. We'll discuss the reasons for which we sometimes recommend this type of operation. I'll go over the surgery itself in terms of its technique, and then we'll discuss expected recovery, and I'll also review the associated risks of that operation. This is a model of the cervical spine, which refers to the area of the spine in the neck. We typically have seven cervical vertebrae that we number from top to bottom, one all the way down to seven. So we call them cervical one, or C for short, all the way down to C7. And between the bony vertebra, which are the building blocks of the spinal column, we have the so-called discs that are natural shock absorbers. They play a role in absorbing the loading stresses of the body in the neck. They play a role in supporting the head over one's lifetime, so when we jump and land and walk and stand and so forth. Behind those discs lies the spinal canal that houses and protects the spinal cord, and the spinal cord in turn gives off these nerve roots that exit the neck and go into the shoulders and arms and hands and provide feeling and strength in those areas. As we get older, we can start to see degeneration of the discs. Those discs can lose their natural height and shock absorbing ability and then they can start collapsing and bulging backwards. And that's when they can narrow the tunnels through which the nerve roots come out. The typical symptoms of a cervical disc herniation are neck pain that can travel into the shoulder and arm and hand with associated tingling or numbness or weakness in the distribution of the nerve root that's compressed. In the majority of circumstances, these symptoms can get better on their own. We recommend conservative measures such as a period of rest. We can prescribe certain medications such as anti-inflammatory medication or muscle relaxants, steroids, or even a short course of opioids or narcotics. Physical therapy can help to relieve the signs and symptoms of cervical disc herniation. If the pain is severe, we sometimes consider steroid injections, which involve injecting steroids in the back of the neck with an x-ray machine that's typically done by a pain management specialist. If the symptoms persist despite these treatment measures, or if you have persistent neurological impairment, such as weakness or tingling or numbness in the shoulder or the arms or the hand, then we consider surgical intervention. There are two basic surgical approaches to this condition. The first is the front of the neck, and the second is the back of the neck. Today what I'm going to talk to you about is a minimally invasive surgery through the back of the neck. What that essentially involves is an operation done under general anesthesia, and patients are placed on their belly. The incision that we make for this is less than an inch, and essentially place a tubular retractor, a small tube, and dock it onto the roof of that tunnel through which the nerve root exit. We then bring the microscope in, and we can unroof that tunnel to give the nerve more breathing room. That operation takes about an hour to do, and it's usually outpatient surgery. Patients go home the same day. You do have some surgery pain for typically a week to a couple weeks. You you feel like a charley horse in the back of the neck, and that usually requires a pain medication and a muscle relaxant. We impose physical restrictions for several weeks. Sometimes the use of a soft collar can help. This also reminds you not to do too much in terms of movement of the neck. And then after a couple weeks, we usually remove the soft collar. We can then begin some physical therapy and range of motion exercises. The success of this operation for the relief of nerve root compression looks well, quite good. It can be up to 75 to 90 percent. Now, it's not 100%, and not every operation is successful, and there are reasons for that. Sometimes we get to the nerves too late, and they're chronically damaged, and there are other potential reasons as well. The advantage of this operation over the anterior approach is that it does not involve a fusion. It does not involve an artificial disc replacement. It does not involve the use of any implants. The risks of this operation are as follows. There's a risk of infection, which is typically less than 1%. At our institution, we studied the risk of infection with the use of minimally invasive tubular retractors, and we found that it was 10 times less than the average because those tubular retractors form a barrier to infection, and the incision is so small. There's minimal bleeding from surgery. Any operation around the nerve roots of the neck or the spinal cord can theoretically carry a risk of injury to the nerve roots or the spinal cord. That can cause persistent pain, it can cause persistent numbness or weakness. A severe injury could even produce paralysis or loss of feeling or loss of bowel or bladder or sexual function. The risks of a spinal cord or nerve injury from this operation is exceedingly low, typically less than 1%. There's a small risk of a leakage of spinal fluid from the fluid that surrounds the nerve roots and the spinal cord. The risk of that is around 5%. 
If it happens, we typically see it in surgery. We can inject glue to seal it up, or sometimes we put a small suture to suture up the hole that's leaking. We take leakages seriously because if they persist after surgery, they can produce headaches, or if a spinal fluid leak leaks through the wound, it can cause a severe infection. There is a risk that the disc could herniate again in the future or continue to wear out, and that can cause recurrent symptoms. In those circumstances, we would probably consider an operation from the front to remove the disc entirely and to either fuse the vertebra or perform an artificial disc replacement. The chance of that happening is probably around 10%.